Thank you, Joe and Olga, for the kind um, uh, introduction. So um, a belated uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Firstly, I would like to thank Joe and the team at the Slavic Reference Service at the University of Illinois for the kind invitation for us to share the work that we do at the National Library of Singapore, and to, of course, thank all the participants for joining us. Uh, next, please. I would like to kick off the session uh, with a general introduction uh, to the work we do at the library, after which uh, my colleague Janice, who is a librarian with our Singapore and Southeast Asian uh, department, uh, will share with you um, a project that we did to document the experiences of the Singapore public uh, during these trying times. And she is actually the main driver of the project. Um, Sarah, um, who leads our outreach team, and she has been involved with our successful information literacy efforts um, for many years now, will share with you um, our experiences. And uh, last but not least, uh, Shan Shan um, will speak on our digital engagement efforts. Uh, and she was actually, Shan Shan was the one who charted our explorations on our latest social media platform, uh, TikTok. I would also like to introduce and thank my colleague Aisha for doing my slides and for organizing us for this uh, presentation. So let's begin by first introducing Singapore. Singapore is a small uh, city state um, and we're a very young nation. Uh, we turned 55 last August, but of course our history goes back to over 700 years. Singapore has in the past, as well as in the present, been a port city where trade between East and West not only brought in goods, but also ideas and people. In case you're wondering how small, you can basically uh, drive across the island from east to west in about 45 minutes or perhaps an hour because of the traffic. Because of our history, we are also a culturally rich and diverse society with different religious affiliations speaking different languages. With no hinterland and not blessed with oil or minerals, we have always depended on the skills of our people which underlines the importance of libraries in cultivating the love for reading and learning. Next, please. The body that was set up in 1995 to look after the development of libraries was the National Library Board of Singapore. So this is our vision and our mission. And in 2012, the National Archives of Singapore came under its umbrella. Next, please. We run 26 public libraries throughout the island, the National Library Board, that is, and um, of course, the National Library, which is found in the city, and the National Archives, which is not too far away. Next, please. So the National Library, uh, this is actually an, an, a picture of um, our National Library building. And um, we um, occupied this uh, building in 2005, but of course our history, as Joe had mentioned, is much longer than that. So how did it all begin? Next, please. This is actually, uh, uh, next please. Aisha, could you, yeah, thank you. So, um, on the right is actually the first report of the Singapore Library, which was published in 1844. But the idea, as Joe had mentioned, was first proposed by, of a library uh, in Singapore, was first proposed by the British administrator, Sir Stanford Raffles in 1823, a few years after the arrival of the British to the island in 1819. So the idea was to have a library in a school and um, the school was called the Singapore Institution. Because of public demand um, for a public library, uh, the Singapore Library was first established and it was the first subscription library. But the collections grew over time and by 1887, the library which first started off by having a small showcase of coins and other items um, had acquired a twin institution the museum. 
So the, the, the picture you see here is a picture of the new home that the Raffles Library and Museum, as it was known in 1887, moved into their new home on Stamford Road, which now houses the National Museum of Singapore. So next, please. Uh, next, please. So fast forward, we moved to our building in 2005, and this is where the public can get access uh, to our reading rooms and of course to the rich collection that we have on Singapore. We have uh, two twin missions. Um, so first of all, uh, to, to collect, preserve, and of course to make accessible our national collection. And the second is to really to support um, um, and build a national reference collection to support research. And I'll show you some statistics. Um, so we have about um, 1.67 million visits to our reading rooms. Of course, uh, this was for 2019. Uh, we had, of course, seen a drastic drop uh, during COVID last year. We were closed for about three months and we, we still have um, social distancing measures in place. So there are reduced capacity. Um, we get about 7 million uh, visit, visitors to our websites with about to uh, 21.4 million page views. As you can see, it's, it's a very small uh, staff strength. Next, please. Our collections come from three main sources, from um, purchases, from legal deposit, as well as an active uh, donation program. As you can see, our, our physical collection is not very large. It's about 2.3 million items out of which um, the out of which majority comes through us from uh, the legal deposit meaning that publishers are required by law to deposit two copies of um, their publications to the national library i realize you don't have this particular law in the us um, so uh, for us in singapore that's how we get a lot of our publications we recently um, amended our act in order for us to collect websites, um, so to archive the .sg domain websites without having to seek permission, which, which is very important because a lot of uh, information about Singapore is now being published on websites. And, and we are also experimenting uh, with a social media archiving. Next, please. I'd like to share um, some of uh, our special um, material, uh, rare materials collection, which is about 19,000. And on the left, uh, just, just two examples. So on the left is a painting of Singapore. Um, behind, on the, on the reverse is actually an address that the, um, a pledge of loyalty uh, that the Chinese community had written and presented to Prince Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, during his visit to Singapore and of course later on um, to uh, Australia um, in 1869. So he was the first uh, British royal to visit uh, the colonies in, uh, to Singapore. And on the right is a, um, a map uh, of the East Indies uh, showing a place called Singapura, which we assume that it, they meant Singapore. Next, please. Aside from our physical collection, we of course have a vast uh, digital collection of about 1.6 million items. Uh, this of course does not include our subscribed third party databases. Uh, it, it consists of digitized materials of our collection as well as um, born digital. Next please. So I'd like to share with you our two digital products, um, very popular products. Uh, newspaper SG, SG stands for Singapore in short, and our Infopedia, which are both popular for schools and researchers. Uh, the newspaper SG, uh, which is an amazing treasure trove of, you know, 34 million uh, newspaper articles from the 1827 onwards in our four official languages, English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. And we get about eight to nine million visitors each year, page views each year. 
Infopedia, as you can imagine, is a ripoff um, from uh, Wikipedia, which is our electronic encyclopedia on Singapore that's written by librarians. And um, it's, it's very, very popular. In fact, it's often quoted uh, in the newspapers or by researchers as an authoric, um, authoritative source on Singapore's history. Next, please. We have also recently uh, launched a new digital site uh, where we use digital storytelling to you know, explore and repackage some of our existing materials. For example, we have uh, virtual reality tours, um, as well as you know, a before and after where we put images from the past and the present together to tell a story about different places in Singapore. Next, please. To build up our collections, we also work with other institutions to augment our collections. Um, and this is a project we call the Singapore Digital Resource Project. What it is, is that we collaborate with overseas institutions who might have a unique or rare archives or printed materials on Singapore and the region. And we um, pay for the digitization so that we can make it more accessible. So if um, your library or your archive have materials that you think will be of interest to us, please do let us know. And the reason why we do this is because we want to enable a more holistic understanding of Singapore from different perspective. Next, please. <clears throat> like many libraries, um, we have an active programming schedule to make our collections more known to the public. Um, ex exhibitions are certainly one avenue, we do that. Um, we launched uh, our permanent exhibition on newspaper in March last year. Sadly, we had to close the library soon after because of COVID, but um, my colleague Sarah will tell you what we, we had to do to make sure that we could you know, pivot uh, from the physical experience to a digital experience. We do a temporary exhibition, at least one major one each year. And oftentimes um, we borrow from various uh, international institutions. So for example, the last year we did one to explore some of Singapore's early history and a, a very popular one on advertising. Next, please. I'd like to share with you also a service that um, is pretty new. It's called Eye on Asia. It's actually a resource site that you will find in our reading room, as well as in the virtual world. It was really developed uh, with the intent of exposing young professionals to explore opportunities in the region for their career and you know, also ideas for business. And Singapore is a small country, oftentimes, you know, the population um, are found uh, to explore or to work in other countries elsewhere. We are also in the process of developing a similar service to provide business resources. Because of the pandemic, we had to quickly move from physical programming to digital programming. Being on a digital platform allowed us to also try out new ideas for example, for our annual signature program, which we call Four Conversations, because it was digital, we were able to experiment and pair an overseas speaker with a local speaker to have a conversation on topics such as mental well being or the state of the arts during this pandemic. It would have been very expensive for us to do so, you know, if it was a physical um, program. Next, please. Of course, another way we reach out to um, the public is through our publications. And just to share, our quarterly magazine, Biblio Asia, can be accessed by anywhere, uh, by anyone around the world because it's found on the website. We also started um, the blog during the pandemic and we have, we have um, you know, a variety of uh, topics you know, featuring our rare collections you know, the work of the librarians, as well as stories about the collection that Janice is going to speak on a little bit later on. Next, please. Of course, um, serving researchers is a standard service of all libraries. 
Um, we have been working, um, and I wanted to highlight is that we've been working with various academic institutions recently on digital humanities project. One was a networking um, you know, uh, project of, uh, of prominent Chinese personalities. Um, and the other is on uh, digitized historical maps. We also organized, unfortunately, we, we couldn't do this um, during COVID last year uh, for um, a, re a researchers, an annual event called the Researchers Networking Sessions, where we have this opportunity to showcase some of the new collections that we've gotten um, to interest them to use the use it for their research and also to understand you know their needs as well as their research trends so it's, it's, a, it's a really very good um, interaction between librarians and the researchers next please we also run uh three uh research fellowships i, I won't go through them um it's just to point out that um, we just launched it uh, in 2019, our, um, the Digital Fellowship, which is a new fellowship um, to really support research in the emerging field of digital humanities using our collections. Next, please. Engaging the community um, to you know, use our collection, to work with our collection is a very key activity of our library. Um, we work a lot with volunteers. So on the right, you'll see that we do a um, docents program where we get them to um, our volunteers uh, lead tours of our exhibitions to the public as well as to students. Um, and on the left, we have interest groups. Um, this is a Jawi interest group. And this interest group meets um, to help translate or transcribe, I should say, uh, Jawi, which is a Malay written in Arabic text to Romanize alphabets so it can be more discoverable uh, through our websites. We are also planning to engage the support of volunteers, more, uh, more programs to get the support of our volunteers to make our collections more discoverable. We also engage communities to build collections. So these are just two examples where we work with the Tamil community to get to build up a digital archives of their theater, their music and dance. And we're currently working with the Singapore Malay Performing Arts. Next, please. And uh, finally, um, I would also like to share that since uh, 2019, we have started working with the Autism uh, Resource Center to employ their clients to help us with the shelf reading aspect of in our reading rooms. And it has been an immensely rewarding experience, not just for them, but also for our staff. Uh, with that, um, I would like to hand over uh, to Janice. So thank you very much. And I look forward to interacting with you in the Q&A session. Janice, please. Okay. Thank you, Huisim. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be sharing about uh, our efforts to collect materials about contemporary Singapore, specifically our Documenting COVID-19 in Singapore project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, some of you may recognize the face of the internet celebrity cat, Tada Sauce here, who is better known as Grumpy Cat. But what is the sign behind it all about? So this A4 sized sign titled Safe Entry with a QR code is seen all around Singapore today at the entrances to businesses, schools, workplaces, libraries, and more. So Safe Entry is a national digital check-in system that locks individuals entry into a venue to facilitate contact tracing and uh, the identification of you know, COVID-19 clusters. So scanning this QR code to check in and out of places is mandatory and one of the new habits that we have to adopt during the pandemic. So this sign you see here with Grumpy Cat is located at the entrance to a shopping mall in Singapore. And I like how whoever made this sign added a touch of humor to something that can often feel like a chore. So this photo was one of the many contributions to our documenting COVID-19 in Singapore project. Next, please. So this project uh, involves the community in building a collection of materials that capture the impact of COVID-19 on everyday life in Singapore. It was launched last May and will run for a year until uh, this June. 
but you know this uh, the deadline may change depending on the situation. So here on the right, you see the project poster. So basically, we welcome the public to contribute photographs, personal stories, videos, and also nominate websites. You know about the pandemic in Singapore. You know these uh, the content could be about the changes they see around them or in their own lives, as well as any stories about acts of kindness that they witnessed or, or the work of frontline workers during this extraordinary time. And we are also coordinating with our, uh, not yet, <laughs> we are also coordinating with our sister institution, the National Archives and the National Museum on this collecting effort. Yeah, okay, so why did we embark on this project, right? So uh, documenting COVID-19 in Singapore is part of our strategy uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> to collect today for tomorrow. So uh, as uh, what Huizhi mentioned just now, right? So like other national libraries, the National Library of Singapore aims to collect and preserve documentary heritage that is representative of our country's history and culture. But, you know, with new technologies and, you know, the evolving information environment, this has meant that we need to diversify our collecting approaches and formats to anticipate gaps and work to bridge them and hopefully future-proof our collections, right? So we build our collection in various ways, you know, like other national libraries, uh, there is ongoing systematic collection through legal deposit, uh, web archiving, acquisitions and donations, and for the National Archives, it would be the transfers of government records and their oral history program. So in addition, we have also worked with various partners and the community to collect materials along certain themes and topics as and when the need or opportunity arises. And also some of the digital archives projects that we highlighted earlier that we have done. Mm. So today, as new content is being churned out at an unprecedented pace in response to breaking news and significant events such as COVID-19, we are also exploring more dynamic ways of collecting in the moment as history unfolds. Okay, next please. So documenting COVID-19 in Singapore actually spans across these collecting approaches, but it draws more heavily upon crowdsourcing and collaboration with partners to build a diverse contemporary COVID-19 collection. Okay, next please. Okay, so now I will touch on the development of the project against the backdrop of the pandemic in Singapore, which will also kind of flesh out our dynamic approach to collecting. So Singapore saw our first case of COVID-19 on 23rd January 2020. On 8th February, the disease situation was raised to orange status. So this acronym you see here, DOSCON, it stands for Disease Outbreak Response System Condition. Yeah, I know it's a mouthful, but anyway, it's a, it's a color-coded framework that describes the current disease situation and it provides general guidelines on what needs to be done. So just a bit of background, this framework was developed from Singapore's experience with an earlier pandemic in 2003, almost 20 years ago, uh, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome or SARS pandemic. So this status goes from green to yellow to orange and lastly red in order of increasing severity. So orange, Doscon orange indicates that the disease is severe and it spreads easily from person to person, but it has not spread widely in Singapore and is being contained. So we went orange on 8 February, two weeks after the first confirmed case in Singapore. So, but as early as February, we received our first COVID-19 related publications and ephemera, such as the business continuity guide and poster you see on the, on the right, the stay at home poster. So these were received through legal deposit. We also began archiving COVID-19 related websites. So I think at this early stage last February, you know, these would have been mainly the government publications and the websites providing information and advisory about the disease situation and, you know, the kind of measures that people should take to protect themselves. So at the same time, we also had a team of librarians looking out for COVID-19 related social media posts. Uh, on Facebook and Twitter, and they would make screen grabs of these, including, you know, uh, misinformation and fake news about the disease, which uh, my colleague Sarah will touch on later. So coming into March, you know, we had a mini crowdsourcing effort among uh, National Library staff to photograph the changes uh, they see around them and how people are responding to COVID-19. So for example, if I happen to be out and I saw, you know, long queues or empty shelves at the supermarket, you know, I would take a photo and then I will contribute it to our own collections. So March was also the time when we were busy preparing for the closure of our libraries and we were working to provide access to services and collections online. So a lot of things going on at the same time. 
So on 7 April, uh, Singapore entered circuit breaker, which was our version of a lockdown period when everyone was asked to stay home and uh, you know we can only go out for essential purposes. So the start of circuit breaker also marked the closure of our libraries. So I think this was a time of you know a lot of adjustment to a new situation. You know we were like trying to get used to working from home, and there were many long Skype meetings. So now that the library closure was complete, we turned our attention to developing the public call. So you know we had about two to three weeks to plan and make it happen. You know we determined what to collect and how. And given the time constraint, you know we worked very quickly with our collections team and our uh, IT department to create you know, a simple project web page with an online form for the public to describe and submit their content. So this is also similar to how other institutions like in, in America and in Australia have done, uh, have gone about collecting COVID-19 content. So we also had a roster of librarians to look through the submissions, store the files and their associated information. So you know, actually we were quite apprehensive about launching the project during this lockdown period and you know we weren't very sure how the public would respond but on hindsight it was actually uh, a very appropriate time because you know there were scenes of singapore that were unique to the circuit breaker period you know such as deserted streets and places which you won't really see uh, at, the, at this moment so i think people were also stuck at home and this project perhaps gave them something to do and you know make meaning out of their stay home experience so we received many submissions about how people spend time at home and kept in touch with their loved ones. So in June, the lockdown period ended and Singapore entered the first and second phase of a gradual reopening. Okay, next slide. Yeah, okay. So from 19 June, you know, more businesses reopened and people could now shop and dine out again. So understandably, you know, the public submissions kind of tapered off because everyone was you know, busy uh, enjoying the new freedom in a way. So from July, uh, we started to actively identify and approach some 270 organizations across different sectors for them to deposit their COVID-19 related materials with us. So these organizations, you know, they ranged across different industries. You know, we had healthcare, hospitality, education, transport and more. And there are two examples here on the right. So first, you know, we receive uh, amongst their other the con other content that they submitted. First, you know, we had a social media post created by the company that operates the cable car attraction in Singapore. So you know, they were telling their customers uh, to like avoid the crowds and take to the sky. So you know, it was kind of like social media content that was very um, specific to COVID nineteen. Yeah, and then uh, on the bottom, you see it's a photo of employees of our subway service having their temperature taken at work. So. Okay, moving forward, then after, uh, after the National Archives launched their COVID-19 Community Oral History Project in August, some of our National Library staff also underwent training as interviewers and we also volunteered to conduct oral history interviews via Zoom with contacts identified via the public call. So, you know, there are contributors to the public, uh, to the crowdsourcing effort who have rich experiences to share and it is more effective to record these through an in-depth interview. Lah. So... At the time of launching the project, we weren't sure how the pandemic situation was going to go and we tentatively planned for the project to go on for six months ending uh, in December 2020. But, you know, as Singapore prepared for further uh, loosening of COVID-19 restrictions in the third phase of our gradual reopening, which uh, was on 23rd, uh, 28 December, so uh, we decided to extend the project by another six months until June 2021. So as of end December 2020, we have received nearly 3,500 items from the public and archive over 4,200 websites and pages. Okay, next please. Okay, this is just to quickly share how the project web page looks like and the functions of the online submission form. So basically the website is where we put, you know, the information, you know, guiding the public on what they can contribute, you know, the content that they created themselves and they can also nominate content created by others. So the online form that they fill up, right, has fields for the user to, you know, describe the files, write their personal stories with the help of guiding questions. They can indicate how they prefer to be acknowledged. They can input a link to, to, to their files on like maybe Google Drive, and then they can agree to the terms and conditions. So you can refer to the URL uh, above for more details. Okay, uh, next please. Okay, now for the more interesting part of the presentation, highlights from our COVID-19 collection. 
Okay, so you know we are interested in collecting other people's ground up documentation efforts and we're really happy when Bernie Tan got in touch with us. So Bernie is an artist and a curator and she runs an Instagram account called Take Measures. Uh, you can go and check it out. It's a crowdsourced visual record of safe distancing markers in Singapore. So Bernie contributed over 600 photos that she took of safe distancing markers in Singapore, right? So on the left uh, is a photo of table and stools cordoned off with tape. So these tables and stools are found at the common areas of our public housing apartments. So during the pandemic, right, community facilities such as these were blocked off using tape to prevent people from mingling around them. Right. So on the right is another example of using sticky tape to mark out the places where people should and should not sit, you know, to maintain like a one meter distance between, between themselves. So this uh, is an example of a uh, Yes, so this is at an open area in a shopping mall and you can imagine how the creative use of sticky tape in public spaces can very often look like an art installation, right? Okay, next please. So an example of contributions from the front line include these, you know, very beautiful photos from uh, Dr. Shyamala Tilagaratnam, whose team at the Health Promotion Board of Singapore organized and implemented COVID-19 tests at the migrant worker dormitories in Singapore. Next, please. So people also share their experiences of live events during the pandemic. So here, uh, Yvonne Cheng shared with us how she and her husband welcomed their first child during circuit breaker in Singapore. So um, Yvonne was also one of the contributors to the public call whom we subsequently interviewed for oral history, you know, to capture, you know, a more detailed account of her, her experiences uh, giving birth, right? So, okay, next, please. So community celebrations were also affected. So for example, here, uh, Muhammad Farhan shared with us a series of photographs he took of his family celebrating Eid at home during circuit breaker. So the festival of Eid marked the end of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan and is also known as Hari Raya Puasa in Singapore. So, you know, a lot of things were done over Zoom. Okay, next please. Okay, lastly, we also have, you know, submissions about acts of kindness. So here, Oliver Kuo and his wife, Amanda Chua, they started a project to sew masks with a transparent window for the deaf and hard of hearing who rely on lip reading to communicate. Okay, next please. So for access, right, the contributions, which are predominantly photos, will be progress progressively described and uploaded onto PictureSG, the National Library's database of Singapore-related photographs. So you can, uh, you know, just follow this URL and go and check, check out uh, PictureSG. You can just search for COVID-19 and all the uh, related images will, will appear. Okay, next please. So just now, Huisin mentioned that we started our National Library blog uh, during the pandemic period, right? So we are also featuring the collection in a series of blog posts on our National Library blog, and we have plans to showcase the collection in a future exhibition. Okay, next please. Okay, I'll just like to end my presentation with one of my favorite photo submissions. So uh, this uh, Grace Ho shared this photograph of a sign with the words, hope you are doing okay, pasted on the window of a neighboring public housing apartment. So Grace said, I was sitting in my room doing my work and as I glanced out of the window, I saw this poster that my neighbor did. I don't know who did it, but it gave me a sense of strength and courage to go through circuit breaker. So, you know, we hope you're all doing okay and continue to stay safe and healthy. Now I shall pass the presentation to my colleague Sarah, who will share about our info literacy initiatives. Thanks, uh, Janice. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'll be sharing on our public awareness program to promote information literacy. In 2013, the National Library came up with a four-step way to remind ourselves to think critically and be discerning consumer of, inf of information, especially in the online environments. The four steps are source, understand, resource, uh, research, and evaluate, or sure. It distills the key concepts of information literacy. Next. The SURE program reaches out to people of all ages, including students, working adults, and seniors. We also partners the Ministry of Education to integrate information literacy into the school programs, as well as work with organizations 
to reach out to diverse audience such as community leaders and public officers. Next. A range of resources in different formats such as e-learning, infographics and videos were produced. Some of this content were translated into three other official languages, Chinese, Malay and Tamil. We also organized talks and workshops. Next, please. Since a year ago, when Singapore detected its first COVID-19 case, the public have experienced a rise in fake news and scams related to COVID-19. As library programs were cancelled or postponed, we step up to run virtual talks, such as combating COVID-19 fake news and fact-checking tools for public. Next, please. There were also resources uh, such as quizzes, uh, animated videos, shared on our website and social media channels to give tips on spotting misinformation about coronavirus. Next, please. The librarians also put up learning packages to recommend current and useful materials about the pandemics. This includes latest podcasts, videos, journals, and ebooks from the web from the library. Next. To support our junior college students who were put on home-based learning, our school talks on research skill were converted to video, video tutorials, which the student could watch remotely. Next. We also went ahead with a virtual school competition and more than 240 students from 60 schools participated in this historical scene investigation challenge. The team was on public health in Singapore. Uh, Aisha, uh, the previous slide. The teams was on public health in Singapore from 1900 to 2000. Working in groups of four, the students were judged on their historical inquiry, presentations, and research skill. Next. Last March, the National Library launched a new permanent exhibition, the News Gallery, which focused on media and information literacy. It also features the library's rich resources on newspaper. Highlights of the gallery include fake news busting game, an important episode in Singapore history through the perspective of the different media. As what Hussein shared, unfortunately, the gallery has to be closed shortly after it was launched due to COVID-19. Next, please. Hence, we moved digital to connect with our audience. A virtual gallery was developed together with digital offerings for parents and their children. In this example, we use Gacha Live apps to create this survivor cartoon panel to let children draw and tell their own adventures. You can see the cartoon characters are also all masked up and keeping safe distancing in a cyberspace. Next, please. There are also games and quizzes for teachers and students to pick up a useful information skill on the, the virtual site. Next, please. With a changing media landscape, educators in digital and information literacy are playing an important role. The National Library set up a digital and information literacy community of practice to bring together people of uh, like-minded practitioner to learn, share, and network. The COP met twice virtually last year to discuss the challenges faced in this uncertain time. Bridging the digital divide and educating people on how to stay safe online will continue to be important topics. With that, I thank you for your attention. Now I will hand over to Shan Shan, who will be speaking on the library marketing tactics. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. 
Um, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share with you our marketing tactics and uh, our publicity efforts that we've been doing uh, from the National Library Singapore, especially during this period when uh, many of us are stuck at home. There has been a much uh, clearer focus on digital marketing initiatives. Next slide, please. So um, we recently went through a re-op uh, re at the National Library and the marketing team now looks after um, the whole of the National Library board, including the archives and public libraries marketing initiatives. Um, for the National Library specifically, we actually look at um, marketing our collections, our services, our content and our programs. So on this slide, you just see a small taster of um, all, these, uh, all these things that we market. Next slide, please. So um, in February last year, we launched this creative program called Everyone Has a Story. Um, this was uh, with the objective of uh, bringing about greater awareness and appreciation of the significant and rare materials in our National Library collection and the National Archives collection. Um, and also to share the importance of the work done by these institutions. So uh, we found some really fascinating stories during this, uh, during this project. And the idea was to kind of drive the public impression that um, the National Library and Archives are more than just institutions for research, but they are also, um, they contain stories that connect us to the larger Singapore imagination and Singapore story. Um, hence the, the tagline of everyone has a story. So I've included the QR code here, um, if you'd like to take a, uh, if you'd like to watch the video on your own time. Next, please. So um, with this campaign, uh, we uh, picked out certain artic uh, artifacts um, in, our, in our collection to highlight. Um, one of them was called The uh, Magic Fan, which is a magazine that was published in the 1930s. And this uh, item is from our rare collection. So you may be thinking that actually 1930s doesn't seem that old to be considered a rare collection, perhaps in the US, but in Singapore, our, because our climate is actually quite hot and humid and it's um, not very conducive for the preservation of paper-based materials. So, um, and also during the um, during World War II, uh, many precious materials were lost uh, during the Japanese occupation of Singapore. So um, that's why this is also part of our rare collection. So this magazine actually is very interesting because it shows you um, like what uh, kind of magic tricks were popular in the 1930s, um, how to do magic tricks, and like uh, listings of performances and magic events during that time. And this was a time when there was significant interest in magic as a form of entertainment and there were magic clubs formed, such as the Malayan Magic Circle. So um, this co the compelling narrative of this uh, club's history is detailed in this, in this publication. This made a very easy decision for us to feature this in our campaign. I've included the video link as well, so you can watch that on your own time. Next, please. So um, other than um, launching our campaign digitally, we also supported this through out of home media buys. So uh, we also drove traffic via bus stop ads and subway ads, um, as well as our library owned channels through these ads you see. Next please. So uh, we also released this um, very interesting video series uh, last year in May. It's called From the Stacks. Uh, this was our second season producing this. Um, so in this series, we featured rare, uh, rare items from our National Library collection. And these videos were presented by our librarian colleagues. And we also invited special guests such as researchers. And um, this is a uh, pretty new format that we're trying um, in terms of really getting our librarians to come in front of the camera and be the star presenting our collections. And it, I think it provides a much uh, more a human touch and uh, shows a great, has a great, also has a greater reach to different audiences rather than our, our usual. And um, uh, needless to say, our librarians were a bit apprehensive at the start, uh, being in front of the camera, some of them a bit shy. But actually, it, this whole series got very good engagement for us. Uh, we averaged about 11,000 views on Facebook per video and about 9,000 views per video on YouTube. And there are actually some very um, touching stories that came out of this, like um, um, one of the, the granddaughters of one of the authors um, of the books featured in this series, uh, a book about Malay and nursery rhymes. She came down, she saw the video and she came down to the library to view her grandfather's book and it was a very uh, meaningful experience for her. And th these are all the kind of, these are the connections that we would like to build 
um, with, our, with our National Library collections. So this series, uh, this series was published on our uh, own social media channels and also supported by digital media buys. Okay, next, please. So now I'm pivoting a bit more into uh, the new, newer initiatives that we've been taking, also very digitally focused. As I mentioned, now that we're spending a lot more time at home, uh, we have to come up with new ways to reach out to our audiences and also uh, convert uh, non-users into use fans of our, of our National Library. So um, podcasting is something that's not new to, uh, to the US. I'm sure um, it's very popular in the US, but it's still quite a nascent uh, emerging platform in Singapore. Um, so this is one of, this is our first uh, library podcast that we're producing, we'll be launching soon this year. Um, we are, it's, it's part of our effort to experiment with different ways to present our collections. And um, for this series in particular, it features our Singapore music collection. Um, it is hosted by our programmer colleague, uh, you see in the first video on the left. Um, it also features conversations with librarians and special expert guests, uh, such as journalists and researchers. So uh, it de depends on the topic for the, each episode. Yeah, so this is something that we're quite excited to launch later this year. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so um, another interesting uh, um, uh, uh, initiative that we did was um, during uh, Singapore circuit breaker, um, our lockdown period, um, that was a period, as Janice mentioned, when the libraries were closed and we weren't allowed to go into the libraries as well. So we, we asked ourselves this question, um, what does a librarian do without a library? So um, that was where the idea for this se short series called Librarians at Home was born. So um, this is a, uh, we, we produced eight uh, mini episodes. So in these uh, videos, we introduce the viewers to our librarians and what they do in like a fun, lighthearted uh, style. Um, and we also incorporated like games and memes and like kind of quizzes about the librarians and our collections. So in a way, it's a way to get to know both our librarians and also the collections. And if you notice from the screenshots that um, the video was done in quite a, it was shot in quite a like DIY uh, guerrilla way. Like we basically shot uh, over video conferencing at home. Um, and you notice it's not as professionally shot as the previous series I shared from the stacks. Um, but I think this is all part of being agile and responsive to the evolving situation, making the best out of it. And of course, also keeping our fans engaged at home. Next, please. So um, just a quick run through of our social media channels. Uh, we are on most of the major social media platforms that people use. Um, we have about 54,000 followers on Facebook and about 9,000 followers on Instagram. Um, our uh, main content pillars here uh, are Singapore stories as well as art and literature. So um, these also intersperse with uh, program, pro uh, program posts and trending topics and uh, promotional posts. So all of these, generally the style that we try to adopt is to be more succinct and casual so, because we know that information sometimes can be quite dense and we don't want to like, make it too dry for people. So it's about keeping it approachable for the layman as well. Next, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we also have been, uh, over the past year, we've also been making a, uh, uh, driving our push notifications, uh, push marketing. Um, this includes uh, WhatsApp and Telegram, which are quite popular in Singapore. Um, so it makes people, it makes it even more convenient for uh, people to access the information which we push out to them. Um, we started our WhatsApp channel in late 2018, and um, this is a channel that we used to program, to promote our content and our programs. And we now have more than 800 subscribers. Uh, Telegram we recently added uh, past few months, and um, this is also kind of. Uh, uh, safety net in case uh, WhatsApp decides to stop its mess messaging service so that we have, we have layers there. Next, please. Okay, and lastly, um, so Huizen mentioned that we also um, started our TikTok earlier this year. We started this in uh, October of 2020. And it's part of our experiment to reach out to a much younger, uh, digitally savvy crowd, uh, much younger than our usual um, target audience. Um, so this is also part of experimenting with different platforms and new ways to present our content. In this case, it's really like bite-sized 15-second, 30-second videos. Uh, 
we have so far we've done quite a eclectic mix of videos, including uh, videos uh, promoting our programs. On the left is a comedy night event that we held virtually. Uh, on the right is a video that our colleague did of um, promoting information literacy. Um, so actually, we've uh, in a short three months we've managed to um, to uh, amass over one thousand followers, which is pretty substantial. So we are looking to develop this further in the coming year. Yeah, and uh, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you guys more in the Q and A. Uh, in the meantime, I'll hand the time over to Joe and Olga. Thanks very much. All right, from this point forward, we'll be doing our Q&A. So if you have any questions, please just type it into the chat below. We also happen to have some questions that were added from our original sign-up form. So I'll be reading a couple of these as we wait for more responses in the chat. All right, let me see. So our first question from, from our sign-up form, how do you decide on the resources to procure for the libraries amid the pandemic? Are you spending less on hardcover books and more on eBooks, for instance? Okay, uh, perhaps um, I could answer that question. We obviously, um, we all libraries around the world would have um, a budget issue. Um, so while we noticed that um, people uh, enjoy uh, the convenience of the digital uh, and, and getting access to ebooks, but um, I'm, I'm speaking for the public libraries in this case, uh, there is still um, a desire uh, and a demand uh, for physical books. So what has been really interesting is that uh, when we started opening up the libraries, um, while the visitorship um, because of the various um, capacity, reduced capacity issues have not uh, caught up with last year's, uh, uh, obviously 2019's uh, figures. Um, actually, the loans of our physical books have actually, uh, is just perhaps 75% less than last year, which is quite amazing considering the fact that the libraries have been closed for, for three months. So, um, we, it's a delicate balance. Um, for researchers, of course, uh, there is a, a, a growing preference for people to get access in the digital world so that they don't have to come down to the library. But there are various issues, it's, you know, with regards to um, uh, not everything will be published online. Uh, it's, in, in some cases, it's, it's extremely expensive for certain databases. So it is, it's, it's, it's always a, a question uh, that we, we battle with. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but it's a calibration that, that we do. So um, I'll just share with you, for example, when we closed, one of the most popular services was um, access to our newspapers. So I, I mentioned about our newspaper SG website, uh, which um, get about eight to nine million. So that, that is very healthy. But um, it is an arrangement that we have with the newspaper, the main newspaper company in Singapore, that we are not able to provide access to the newspapers uh, beyond uh, 1989. So if you wanted newspapers uh, to view the newspapers beyond 1989, you have to come down uh, to the, the library to view the newspapers on microfilm or on, on site. Um, so uh, when this happened, obviously a lot of the researchers, when they couldn't get access to our reading rooms, you know, were calling for us to, you know, um, you know, uh, put the newspapers beyond 1989 accessible, but we couldn't do, do that because of obviously copyright issues with the publishers. So what we have done now is um, we are relooking at the allocation of our budget and experimenting with putting some money to buy licenses to subscribe to the newspaper's um, uh, provision for access to their materials from 1989 onwards. So we'll experiment with that for about two years and we'll see what the response is like. So it's, it's, it's it's a calibration that we, we, we do at the National Library to weigh you know, um, physical and digital. 
I think for certain materials, for example, you know, business, uh, maybe the general reference, which is for us, it's core, but it's not extremely core uh, versus the Singapore Southeast Asian collections that we're, we're trying to uh, look more at the uh, electronic versions. Um, while the Singapore collection, you know, if it's only printed in, in books, we will, will still acquire. So we are also calibrating based on topics. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that was a great answer. Um, let's see. So the next question that we have from our sign up form, this might be somewhat similar to the last one that you just answered. There might be some overlap is what are the key cataloging criteria and adding to the collection? What are the key focus areas to be included in the National Library of Singapore? OK, obviously, we, we um, being the custodian of our, our history and culture, um, the, the main focus really is in acquiring materials on Singapore, uh, usually in the arts and humanities. So obviously, there are other academic libraries in Singapore that perhaps might capture you know, research papers um, by academics. Um, so um, we will look uh, on the uh, humanities mainly. Um, and um, in recent years, because um, we have been through our legal deposit uh, and, and we, we do, I must say, we, we do get great support from our government. Um, so we, we do have a substantial um, acquisition budget. Uh, relatively speaking, uh, and uh, we have been paying uh, closer attention on collecting primary resource materials, which is something unique. So uh, we, and that we do through our donation program. So we work with perhaps, um, you know, um, um, art, uh, writers uh, and clan asso uh, associations, uh, religious associations or community associations to try and get their primary source materials, for example, uh, records of minutes of meeting, um, you know, uh, handwritten books, uh, manuscripts of authors. And so, so the librarians spend quite a lot of time engaging with these um, sources of uh, information, uh, sources. Uh, primary source materials that we're looking at. So we've just launched, um, have, have signed a um, memorandum of understanding with our Arts Council to document, um, you know, um, specific artists um, and writers, uh, cultural medallion, what we call cultural medallion, uh, so recognized artists and writers um, for uh, documentation. So we will be collecting or digitizing their materials. And, and this is one area that I think uh, libraries around the world are struggling. I mean, with, with so many years, we have been pretty good at, you know, looking after physical collection. It is really the digital collections that, you know, it's, it's, it's new, it's, it's, it's not as easy because, you know, um, it's very fluid, uh, it gets obsolete very fast. So how, and we've just started to experiment. So how do we, I mean, we, we obviously have a, a digital preservation system and all, but, you know, so for example, if you want to collect um, the, and, and capture the creative process of a writer, you know, in the past, you would try and collect all his various drafts of his manuscripts or her manuscripts. Uh, but now if we, if they do it on, let's say, you know, Microsoft Word or, you know, you know, whatever program they use, how then do you capture it? How do you capture the different uh, iterations of that particular manuscript if we don't work with the uh, writer in advance? So this is um, a, a new area for us that so we're exploring. How can we engage um, writers to say, you know, before you, um, um, you should save a copy of your work in its different phases. Yeah, so, so these are really interesting um, things that we're trying to do to capture and, and have a more comprehensive um, collection of the diverse experiences of Singaporeans. Great response. Um, just a heads up to everyone who's still in the room. If you have a specific question that you would like to ask, please just type it into the chat, particularly even if you've filled out the form with a question, questions in the chat will be prioritized over form questions. So if you have one that you really want us to get to, make sure to type it down below in the chat for us. All right, so moving on to our next question from the form. 
Is the National Library of Singapore using any artificial intelligence tools for li library services? If yes, please explain. If no, are you planning on using artificial intelligence in the near future? Yes, we're always experimenting. Um, so we, well, um, I think uh, one of the areas that we're hoping to do a lot more of is, is personalization. And, and this, um, I speak for the National Library Board. So we um, are trying to see, you know, how can we use artificial intelligence to, you know, offer personalized services uh, for our patrons. So, so for example, if you were to sign in with your library ID on on your uh, on our mobile app, you know, and and the machine knowing, you know, what was your borrowing patterns, what you you might have indicated, uh, what um, topics of interest uh, that you have, um, and then for the machine to be able to um, you know recommend the kinds of materials that you'll be interested in, uh, it's still in nascent stages um, at the moment. We're also thinking, so that would be, you know, that the, the, the service part, the experience of, of the patron. The, uh, the other aspect is um, we're hoping to, and, and of course there are already existing voice to text messages. So we're, we, for example, at the library and the archives, we have quite a bit of handwritten material that right now we get um, people, volunteers through crowdsourcing efforts to transcribe um, so that it's more discoverable. Um, on our website uh, to sort of transcribe, you know, handwritten to type text. But we're also um, thinking of applying, um, you know, AI to see uh, to do that transcription from handwritten to um, uh, type text. Uh, and we are, um, to also experiment from voice, you know, because we have oral histories, voice to text. And we realize, of course, that you know, it's about um, perhaps 60% um, accuracy. Um, but what we're hoping to, to do is to work with technology to train those machines to, to become increasingly more accurate. So how other um, libraries and archives have done is to perhaps get the volunteers to, to train the machine by correcting the, 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 the uh, transcriptions. So um, we're, we're hoping to explore uh, AI, uh, the use of AI in that. It is very expensive. Um, so we're piloting a few projects. Perfect, thank you. And we actually have a question in the chat. Oh, and actually it looks like it was just answered. Well, I guess if you would like to go into more detail, the question is how big is your digital marketing team and how do you achieve a consistent voice across your channels? If you would like to say it over the recording, um, this is for um, Shen Shen Chen. Shen, yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for your question, Anita. Uh, yeah, so we have a team of about 12 people looking after um, 26 public libraries, the National Library and the archives. Uh, within this, um, we also, um, in terms of ma maintaining a consistent voice across the channels, we do have a kind of uh, um, uh, there is a, a, a template that we that we follow in terms of the, the tone that we maintain for the national archives, the, li the national library, and the public libraries because these are all uh, um, targeting very different um, audience mm -hmm. profiles. Yep. So um, when we uh, we also work closely with a social media agency when we are crafting the tone and the messaging of our of our content. So there always is that layer of check um, when uh, we are proposing, uh, when we are generating our content. If I could uh, add on to Shan Shan's um, um, response is that actually um, we find that um, different platforms will also have a different um, sort of we have to adopt different personas. So how you, um, um, what you put out on Facebook uh, cannot be replicated in TikTok, nor should it be necessarily replicated in Instagram. So aside from the kind of branding that you would want for a specific institution, you would also have to adjust depending on the social media platform. Yeah, totally agree with you, Sim. Um, if you guys have seen that meme of Dolly Parton, that viral post from Dolly Parton where she had um, different um, profile pictures for like her Facebook, Instagram, um, uh, TikTok, and I think it was LinkedIn, that those are the kinds of um, tweaks, certain tweaks to our persona that we adopt for different um, channels. Yeah. 
uh, see, I see that Joe also has a question. Um, what methods and tools do you use to collect feedback from patrons and the general public? Um, I guess if this um, referring to uh, marketing, um, terms, we do employ certain listening tools. So um, we are uh, um, for our social media, like say for Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, TikTok, we do, there are inbuilt um, um, insight tools. So we do um, we, we, um, gather feedback from there in terms of the data, which we also do share with our management and our colleagues to kind of continuously fine tune um, our content strategy and whether like new things that we try are working or not working um, so that we can, we can tweak and adjust. Um, in terms of, um, of social media listening as well, um, we also uh, do work with our corporate communications colleagues to uh, surface any like chatter that regarding the National Library that, is, that we should pick up on. Uh, of course, we also have, do have direct messaging channels um, to, um, for our patrons to reach us on like more privately on ma certain matters. Mm, to, to add on to Shan Shan's note, if you're talking about collecting feedback um, from our, let's say, walk-in patrons um, in our reading room, we do conduct a, a customer survey each year. Um, they will um, have about, uh, they will interview actually maybe about um, five to six hundred people um, over a period of time uh, to, you know, to, to feedback on our services, our collections, the environment, you know, our programs, um, and so on. And uh, actually, after each program that we do, we do actually ask for feedback. Um, and um, as a, a whole, the National Library Board, we also conduct a, um, a what we call a reach survey to see, you know, how. And, and this is um, for the the you know the sample sizes. Um, uh, I mean. Is a, is a random sample of the whole population of Singapore. And we conduct that about once in two to three years, where we, two years, I think, um, to, to check you know, how we have reached out um, to the general public. So there, there are many, many uh, feedback channels that we get. And of course, patrons can uh, easily write to our quality service uh, line um, to feedback on any aspect of our service, our, our, our staff, or our collections. All right, and then it looks like we're going to go back to some questions from the sign up form. Um, the next question is, do your digital skills learners come to your library or does your team go out into the community? Mm. Okay, um, so um, for the, um, Sarah, would you know, I mean, if I know for, for most of the time, I mean, we were working, so at the public libraries, yeah. we work very closely with um, a, another sister institution to help, especially the seniors, to, to equip them with uh, digital skills. And because our public library is found scattered throughout the island, uh, oftentimes it is um, the uh, seniors uh, you know, who come to the library and, and learn those skills. Um, I think with COVID, um, we, we, uh, if we were to do any, you know, you know, going out to other uh, spaces. I, I don't think we do that, right, Sarah? Just to yeah, double check. But, yeah, just to add to uh, Huixin's response, uh, the library uh, work with uh, our sister agency called the uh, Infocom uh, Media and uh, Authority. Um, we set up these uh, programs called the Seniors Go Digital, and there are uh, seniors clinic uh, at uh, various uh, public libraries. So, uh, because of COVID, the uh, programs was uh, put on uh, smaller scales, uh, meaning that we only recently uh, has opened this program. Uh, before COVID, actually seniors can sign up at uh, the libraries, uh, various libraries to have a one-to-one -one, uh, digital clinic where they will learn how to um, operate, use their uh, uh, mobile phone, how to download apps. So that's for the seniors. We do also um, have I, programs yeah, for the public. Yeah. Um, and I would like to um, perhaps explain that actually uh, in Singapore, we're, we're quite unusual. As I mentioned, we're really quite small. Um, and so, um, and, um, so the, the National Library, the National Archives and the Public Library, so we're basically under the same umbrella. 
And so um, for certain things, then, um, you know, it will be more in the purview of the public library. So we, it's not necessarily carried out at the National Library. So for example, you know, equipping people with digital skills, it's, it's, it's generally done uh, the role of, the, of our public libraries, just to explain. All right, thank you, that makes sense. Um, the next question is, what is the most successful method that you have found for reaching people specifically during the pandemic? Mm. Wow, I think uh, for me, it's, it's through our Facebook, um, through our programming. Um, yeah, that, that has been a way, but um, I would say that uh, even before uh, the pandemic, um, we have our regulars who use and, and know all of the resources that we have. And so um, it, it has, um, you know, because of the pandemic, um, we were, weren't really affected, especially in the digital aspect. In fact, um, you know, the growth in our digital collections, you know, grew, uh, visits to our digital collections grew. Um, I would say uh, we, a lot of people, and I'm talking about uh, the National Library Board as a whole, um, we, we, you know, a lot of people, because they, they're stuck at home um, and had some time, they started, um, you know, borrowing a lot of books, uh, e-books. And so actually our conversion uh, and new members uh, using our mobile app uh, increased tremendously. And we've seen a tremendous growth in our e-book uh, loans. We, we do, you know, um, through, I mean, we, uh, the National Library Board is often um, featured in newspapers. Uh, so we, we get a lot of publicity that way as well through, you know, newspapers, uh, TV, radio, for uh, numerous projects that, that we, we embark on. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And the whole, um, more people utilizing the mobile phone app. I totally get that. That's definitely been me this entire pandemic. <laughs> yeah. All right. And it looks like we have just enough time for one more question. Um, let's see. So the last question will be, what would you say has been the most successful program in improving citizen information literacy skills? Sarah? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the, at the school front, we were fortunate to be working with the Ministry of Education um, to integrate uh, the IL skill into the curriculum and uh, giving the support from the schools to run uh, school outreach uh, programs like school competitions and teachers workshop. And we were also uh, in a way um, able to reach out to um, targeted audience like um, the civil service um, uh, officers uh, in terms of uh, collaborating with um, public agencies to infuse um, the information literacy concepts, the importance to be discerning uh, at um, uh, different fronts, uh, like um, uh, military recruits, as uh, have to take a information literacy workshop as part of their training, uh, public officers, as well as community leaders. Having said that, um, there's still much more for us to do because um, fake news and misinformation is so pervasive. It's really a multi-pronged approach to, to handling this, uh, this uh, changing uh, media landscape uh, in, in a way. Mm. I hope I answered that question. Oh, yes, you did a great job. All right, that is it for all of our questions tonight. I'm going to pass it over to Joe now. Uh, dear presenters and uh, dear participants, uh, I just want to once again uh, thank our distinguished colleagues from the National Library of Singapore. Uh, this has been such a wonderful uh, discussion and conversation, and uh, we got to know, uh, learn uh, so much about uh, some of the initiatives uh, and services that they're providing. So I want to thank our 
presenters. Uh, uh, thank you very much for participating in this discussion and uh, stay tuned because we're gonna feature the National Library of New Zealand and, uh, and of course, uh, the National Library of the Czech Republic. So thank you, uh, Team Singapore. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Joe. You.